next speaker uh, is Elias, who is an e-advisor, not advisor, from Wabu. And today he'll be talking to us about replicating success at scale, early lessons for Africa. Elias, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you uh, this morning. Actually, it's very possible that I wasn't going to be here and someone else was going to have to do this presentation. Um, for the simple reason that those of you that travel in from South Africa may be aware that there's a, an administrative requirement now that your passport actually has to have a completely clean page, uh, otherwise you won't be allowed into the country. Now, mine didn't. Uh, and I had to get special permission from the immigration officials in Zambia uh, in order to, to travel, and they told me, you're traveling at your own risk. Uh, so I, I really was expecting to be turned back, because many of you will be aware that um, our immigration authorities weren't too generous to the Democratic Alliance leader when he came into Zambia recently. So I was sure they were going to try and return the favor, but um, fortunately it all worked out. I'm going to be speaking to you about replicating success at scale and the early lessons for Africa that we can share um, with you based on the interventions that we've been applying in rural communities within Zambia. So I'm going to start really by talking a little bit about our organization. And there are just four things that I want to highlight. Um, first is that we do focus on providing content. Content really was the driver for the initiatives that we now deploy. And uh, this was all the brainchild of the late Mark Bennett, who set up one of Zambia's first internet service providers uh, and was very keen to get rural schools accessing content via the internet. And his focus initially was on secondary schools, but he quickly realized that there was a more fundamental problem at the earlier levels, um, but had to come up with something that addressed the lack of uh, infrastructure that enabled access to the internet. And so he produced a product that effectively can work uh, offline, um, is voiced, animated, and interactive, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. A second aspect is that there needed to be uh, the question of delivery. And at the moment, we deliver using uh, a, a lockdown tablet, uh, but we are working off a gaming platform, uh, Cocos 2D, that will enable access by any device. Uh, thirdly, and this is something to pick up a little bit from uh, Oliver's presentation, uh, we are trying to focus um, very heavily on what we're calling the Mwabu Academy, because the emphasis must be on supporting the teacher to deliver more effectively. And then finally, um, there's a, a program management uh, component to uh, our organization, which ensures that we have a seamless end-to-end -end, uh, delivery. And again, I'll say a little bit more about this. So our product really focuses on, I, I think, three key things. The first, and I mentioned a little bit about this, is the picture on top, um, which is that the content, because you're dealing with you know, major challenges with uh, getting uh, textbooks, and other material into the classroom. Um, and being able to access the internet is clearly not an option for some of these communities. So the content has to be off offline. Um, now, the tablet that we currently deploy, uh, especially the ones that we have in Zambia, we're working on a project in South Africa as well, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. But currently, it has over 5,000, I think it's something like 300,000 digital files. Um, but there are 5,000 lessons, lesson plans for the teachers. Uh, there's Wikipedia, there's books, uh, all digital text, and this is all available offline. It's interactive, it's colorful, it's voiced, it's animated, and for the early grades, especially to fit into the policy requirements of many uh, countries now, uh, the first three grades have all the materials translated into the local languages. So for Zambia, for example, we have seven main local languages and the full translations are there. Um, there, there is also additional material on the tablets, uh, bespoke content. Uh, so we've got an app there that was prepared for Game Rangers International that helps with uh, training uh, communities in conservancy, uh, their apps on health and also for agriculture so that the broader community can participate in this process. Um, then, of course, we've spoken a little bit about the digital lesson plans and the teaching aids, but I think one of the key things uh, about the system that we deploy 
is the picture in the middle there, which is the rotational model. Now, it, it's not unique to uh, Mwabu, and it's um, effectively the carousel model that we've adopted in order to deal with one key problem, especially in rural communities, and that's large classroom sizes. And the way it works is that the classroom is split into three. Uh, the devices are distributed on a ratio of one to six, uh, bringing the cost down, and I'll say a little bit about the cost later and how we can effectively deliver at a pretty interesting price. Um, but you would have three different activities taking place after the plenary uh, at the start of the class, and you have uh, paired um, seating with uh, two children per tablet uh, sitting around one section of the classroom. Uh, then you have a role play where they're learning something that might be from the lesson that they've learned on the tablet, and then you've got a session where there's direct interaction with the teacher. And that uh, follows a prescribed uh, timing and process, and all of that is set out within the lesson plans, uh, effectively supporting the teacher to deliver effectively even to a class of 50 plus uh, children. And then uh, the, the final picture there is really um, the, uh, we have embedded in our e-learning uh, content um, some analytics uh, that uh, sit at the heart of our delivery process which help with formative assessment so that you're able to intervene um, before it's too late rather than having the summative assessment at either the end of the term or the end of the year and discovering that the children didn't actually understand uh, the content and uh, going back to do the remediation at that point is too late. So what's our theory of change? Well, there's really, really five things to this. The first is that we want to make sure that children actually enroll and stay in class. Uh, the second is we want to make sure that they progress through the class without repetition. And the third thing is that we want to make sure that they complete, which is the picture at the bottom left there, uh, with either adequate life skills to go on to the next stage of their life or to go on to the next stage of their academic uh, progression. So going into secondary school. Now remember, this is a primary school uh, offering. Now the two things that are critical is the institutional support. Uh, and at the heart of that lies the teacher training in the Mwabu uh, pedagogy and delivery mechanism that I explained a little bit uh, earlier. The second thing is ensuring that we have children engaged with a wide range of activities and approaches to learning, including the blended learning process. And those are the two things that underpin this process of entry, progression, and successful uh, completion. Um, I will say a little bit about um, how that's worked, uh, especially with some of the control schools. And you can see with the map of Zambia there in the top left, I just want to highlight three things. Um, you'll see on the top right-hand side of that particular map, there's the label there for an organization called Impact Network, and they have been working for several years now in schools in the rural part of the east of the country. Um, you'll notice that our footprint there indicates um, an emphasis largely on uh, rural communities. Uh, but Impact Network have been working with non-government schools, so community schools, um, and working with untrained teachers. And you'll see on one of the slides that they've been able to achieve results which are equivalent to or better than those results obtained uh, by uh, government schools. And there, there's, a, there's a reason uh, for that, and they're able to do it at roughly a third of the cost, largely because the cost of uh, teachers in government uh, schools is particularly high with all the benefits that, that flow um, with their conditions of service. Uh, but I do want to highlight two additional uh, areas that we're working in. Uh, one is the bottom left there, you see the UNICEF sign, and they did our first pilot, and they picked an area that they felt was one of the most deprived rural communities in the country to test the implementation of our solution. And uh, again, I'll show you the results on that, achieving better results on the early grade reading ability and early grade maths ability tests that were conducted at baseline, uh, midline, and endline. And then um, there's also at the very bottom there, in the southwest of the country, uh, an organization called the Peter Kandil Foundation that uh, funded um, a project into six schools, um, with uh, control schools being uh, government schools. Uh, and that's running now, that's from 2015 and will run until uh, 2018. Uh, and there's some results that I'll want to show you uh, from that as well. What are our expansion plans? Well, currently across the African continent, the 
countries mapped out in orange there are where we are currently uh, intervening in some form. Zambia, of course, is where everything was hubbed out of and it originated from. Uh, but we also have uh, a project um, with approval by the Kenya Institute of uh, Curriculum Development of Maths and Science from grade one up to grade eight um, that we will be implementing in 21 schools in a conservancy north of Mount Kenya. In Lesotho, we've had a small pilot and we're looking to scale this up now, uh, working with the Vodacom Foundation. Um, the key issue there is uh, engaging government early to ensure the sustainability of the project going forward. Uh, in South Africa, we're working in KwaZulu-Natal in uh, four lab schools, um, and I had the opportunity to, to, to visit the implementation that's working there, and we're working really with the teacher intervention, so we're training the teachers through the Mwabu Academy and uh, ensuring that they can deliver on maths uh, which is the starting subject, but we'll eventually work through the STEM subjects and expand, and this is for uh, grade four. And then we have a project in Tanzania with an organization called Silverleaf Academy, which is um, trying to run a low-cost school model uh, there in Tanzania. Uh, we've learned a lot from that particular experience, particularly with regard to uh, some of the challenges around delivery and uh, reverse logistics. So what have been our findings? And remember that we're really focusing as much as possible on those deprived rural locations. Um, well, first of all, um, that the, the, the teachers do deliver active, engaging, and child-centered lessons. Um, you'll see from one of the slides uh, from our own internal m and &E, uh, that this has been one of the uh, really important um, confirmations that we've received. Uh, the Mwabu schools do achieve better learning than uh, their, the, their peers in the control schools. It is cost effective and affordable, and uh, when I share with you the number um, that we're able to deliver this at, equipment uh, and content, uh, but not including the training and uh, some of the power challenges, especially where you've got uh, off-grid solutions needing to be deployed, but that is extremely cost effective as a running uh, cost. Um, and then as with the example that I gave you with uh, Impact Network in the eastern part of the country, it does support and train teachers uh, working with large classrooms in difficult conditions. Um, I always marvel at um, the reference to rural schools in South Africa because I, I see a road and I can see a town nearby and I can see infrastructure and I'm thinking to myself, this is rural? Uh, but, you know, th these things are, are, are relative. But it is popular with teachers and pupils. Um, so much so that we have a challenge in uh, the school that I uh, shared with you where we have uh, an, an, an interest uh, that's being supported by the Peter Kandil Foundation. Uh, and I attended an Achievements Awards Day uh, last week uh, in Mwandi. And what was interesting was teachers from the control school turned up and they are extremely eager to have the intervention introduced into their schools. And what they have seen, and there's a direct correlation between the increase in the number of pupils that are attending the schools where this intervention is taking place, and a decrease in the number of pupils attending the control schools. So the community is aware that this intervention is taking place, and they're shifting their children to those schools where we're implementing it, and it's having um, that, if you like, negative consequence, but uh, again, these are, these are unforeseen consequences, but it does demonstrate the, the importance of getting that engagement and how it's working within these rural communities. So with the Mwandi project, these are the results that we found, um, and the, the emphasis was really on, again, the, the intervention at the teacher level, so to improve uh, their, uh, the quality of their delivery and the engagement of the children. We just take two metrics here which is you know, teacher interviews after you know, a year of the project. Um, so 73% saying that they're confident with the tablet, 83% uh, of the training, or 82% saying that training was adequate, and um, a whopping 93 saying that it had a positive impact. Um, with the students, uh, the pupils, um, with visual observation, that all the children in the study schools were observed reading during the lessons whereas only two-thirds observe reading in the control schools. We have a much more detailed and elaborate uh, M&E report, which uh, I'll be happy to, to share with anybody that's uh, interested. And I, we also have the M&E report from uh, the Lukulu project, which is the selection of, the, uh, of UNICEF, uh, picking the area that they felt was most deprived. And they used the testing um, of uh, USAID 
uh, that focuses on EGRA and EGMA. Now, there are some people who don't believe that this is a very effective way of testing because you, you, you reach a sort of a, a finite point and how much more can you improve? Uh, but nevertheless, this was the um, module that we used for testing. And with the baseline, you can see with the marble schools, because we were dealing with community schools, obviously it was a lower baseline than the baseline in the control schools, which was the government schools. So they were at 7% in the community schools where we were doing the intervention and 13%. Uh, but after one year, we see the difference in results and that's statistically uh, significant. So what lessons can we share? I think the first thing and, and there are really four things that I'd like to share. First is that we need to have clarity around what we believe the goals should be. And I think it's really important that we keep focused on the learning outcomes. Um, it, it's very tempting and there's sometimes a tension between uh, needing to ensure sustainability um, and being able to demonstrate that there's actually improvement in learning outcomes, but that has to be the primary goal and the focus. Secondly, can we achieve efficiency, improved efficiency? Can we achieve improved equity and access? And lastly, can we see improved quality, which will obviously feed through in the learning outcomes. And uh, the results that we have so far from the areas that we've been testing this, and we've got projects running up in the north of the country through World Vision and various other uh, foundations um, that are supporting this uh, implementation. Again, in deeply uh, rural and inaccessible communities. The second thing, you know, after we have clarity around those, those four goals, you know, the learning outcomes, the efficiency, the equity and access, and the quality, is this set of issues. Now, let me just quickly explain our, our logo there. It's um, an acacia tree with the rising sun and um, represents our original name, which was iSchool. So that the dot being the sun and the S of the acacia tree being iSchool, uh, just in case you're wondering. But I think these are the things that if you're going to achieve um, improvements in learning outcomes. It, you, you can't take an isolated issue and say, well, let's just slot in this piece of technology and we're going to achieve the results that we're looking for. There's a comprehensive set of issues that have to be adopted uh, from power, connectivity, content. Uh, countries like Kenya and Rwanda, Kenya in particular with its digital literacy program, made sure that they had power access to all 22,000 primary schools in order to roll out um, their digital learning uh, program. They also focused on the connectivity piece and they've tested a technology called TV White, Space, uh, TV White Spaces, which we are also testing in Zambia. In fact, a company that's related to Mwabu is working on seeing this implemented in some of the communities that we are already uh, applying our intervention. Uh, where Kenya still has a bit of work to do is on the digital content side, and they're trying to hub everything through the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development portal, uh, and uh, they paid to have some content for the early grades developed. Um, I might get sued for libel or slander if I articulate my thoughts about it, so uh, it's probably best that you, you investigate that yourself. Um, but um, there is still quite a bit of work to be done yet on the content side. Um, then, of course, you've got the equipment and reverse logistics. We're dealing with remote um, rural communities where there literally is no proper decent road, where areas are cut off during the rain season. Um, and then, of course, you know, how do you uh, deal with a problem when it arises? The connectivity does help with dealing with software problems, but if you've got SD cards or you have a micro server from which um, you know, the material is being uh, accessed by the tablets in the classrooms, how do you deal with that you know, when the situation arises that it needs to be supported? Teacher training and ongoing support, absolutely critical. But also critical is capacity building within the government administrative structures uh, because you can only outsource so much and there's already you know, infrastructure in place within the ministries of education and it's about how you leverage that capacity and build up on that capacity to be able to provide the support needed uh, for the teachers and uh, to implement this system. The school management information systems, the learner management information system, the data collection, data analysis, m and &E, and of course the funding. Cost is the, th the third thing. Uh, and I think you've got to look at this from the point of view of absolute versus opportunity cost. I mean, the tendency is that, oh my gosh, it's going to cost so much, we can't afford it. Well, I think 
you, you've got to look at you know, the cost of not implementing this because we're not getting the right outcomes. I think the first speaker spoke about you know, how it is that we still can't give a positive story about education in Africa. And we have an opportunity to do what the mobile phone did in helping us to leapfrog certain technologies uh, and getting around legacy issues that would otherwise be you know, impediments to uh, change. Uh, that you see in the developed world, which you know, Africa would simply embrace because they've got nothing else and this works. Um, and then, of course, the current cost versus future savings. And I'll say a little bit about that um, in just articulating what price we are able to deliver uh, this solution at uh, in these deep rural communities. It's actually between one and two dollars, probably about a dollar sixty um, per child per month. Now, when you compare that, with the current delivery mechanisms, even with the, uh, an incomplete uh, delivery process. So you're not actually having the right number of textbooks delivered, but that's even just with the, the, the limited uh, implementation of what should be the case. Um, it's coming out at less than uh, one quarter of the current cost. And if you were to cost it up properly, as in have all the textbooks available, uh, have all the material available, um, it would probably come out at approximately 10%. Um, it compares very favorably with the current systems, uh, and at scale, uh, because this is on the limited scale that we've been deploying this, uh, we actually believe that on a much wider scale we can deliver this at um, half a, a, a dollar per month per child. And clearly, the long-term benefits of digital uh, education far outweigh um, you know, the short-term costs of um, migrating to a digital system. The final point is uh, stakeholder collaboration. Absolutely essential. Um, they're product and services stakeholders. We can't be a master of all trades. Um, this is going to have to be uh, a collaborative exercise. Uh, there are those that are going to specialize in setting up the server systems, uh, the ability for the microservice to be able to harness data from each tablet that's used, you know, bi biometric identification of each individual user so that you can track exactly how each child is progressing through that particular school day, deal with the challenge of ghost teachers, and all this feeds back. Uh, into the recipient stakeholders like the education ministries, the teachers, the learners, the parents, and the community leaders. And thoughts and challenges. I think it's clear that digital education is affordable, beneficial, and inevitable, but it's not a silver bullet. Uh, and I think that uh, Oliver in his uh, pre presentation spoke about how it is that technology really has to support uh, ongoing initiatives, uh, particularly with regards to how you train and support the teachers to deliver better on their mandate. Uh, the teacher therefore has to remain at the forefront, certainly of primary education, uh, and therefore teacher acceptance and training are absolutely critical. And that's why we've taken um, a lot of, of time to think through carefully how we're going to develop the academy side. It's clearly necessary to solve the power and connectivity challenges to deliver digital education to rural areas. I know here the social enterprise fund uh, mechanism is partly what's being used and, and, and CSR funds, um, and, and that's working to a certain extent. But because most of these schools in these communities are essentially going to be government schools, uh, certainly for, for most of Africa, um, a, a, a much more comprehensive approach to addressing this uh, power and connectivity uh, problem should, should be um, addressed. Clearly, uh, huge benefits will flow from the data analytics, um, and I can just give you one simple example. Um, if you do a test, you'll be able to determine whether you're predominantly left brain or right brain. If you're left brain, you're more process driven. If you're right brain, like me, you're much more creative. Uh, but then you'll find it very difficult to grasp some of the concepts in mathematics. And so, you know, we're putting children through a process driven uh, initiative to help them to understand mathematics when they're inclined more to have a much more creative approach to how they understand these things. And it's this that can feed into uh, empowering the teacher to have a better approach uh, to helping to achieve the right learning outcomes and not frustrating the child in the process. So I, I think this is going to be a huge area um, that will help, I guess, what we call the metacognition process, reflective learning, help teachers and learners, communities, parents, governments to better understand how children learn and to tailor the uh, medium and, and the instruction and the content so that it suits that particular learning style. Um, the penultimate point is that you know, it's important to exploit the opportunity for uh, integrated collaborative approaches. You've got Ministry of Education, Ministry of Agriculture, 
um, Ministry of Health, all going into the same areas, facing exactly the same challenges. And it makes sense to have a, a, a sort of a common carrier approach so that you, you can get uh, better value for money and, and limited resources that are available to governments to deliver in each of these areas. And then uh, finally, providing affordable content, power and connectivity will open up uh, rural Africa to additional services. We're trying to do this in uh, the school project in Mwandi in the south of the country where we're setting up service centers where community members are able to use those service centers and they, play a, they pay a small fee of 20 cents to charge their phone uh, overnight. Uh, and it's introducing new business initiatives as part and parcel of the education delivery. Uh, thank you very much.